Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Yi Cheng Guo, coming from uh, UCSC. Today I'm going to talk about um, how to use candles to study low mass galaxies. I will present the results of two aspects of low mass galaxies, the star formation history and the environmental quenching. So here in this talk, low mass galaxies means stellar mass less than 10 to 9. And this work has been done together with many candles members. Some of them are showing here. So um, <clears throat> the low mass galaxies are important. There are two reasons. First, that they are the building blocks or progenitors of Milky Way-like galaxies at high redshift. So in order to understand the formation of our own Milky Way, we have to understand the physical properties of low mass galaxies at early universe. The second is uh, low mass galaxies provide the most uh, stringent constraints on the uh, bionical physics, especially the uh, feedback, feedback models, because in those low mass galaxies, the gravitational potential waves are shallow, so the effect of a feedback would be most uh, efficient in these systems. However, due to the faintness of those galaxies, the study of low mass galaxies focus on the local universe, but the candles opens a new window to study distant low mass galaxies. Here are all the candles to source galaxies. Different colors means different the H band magnitude. So if we use H of 26 as a nominal magnitude, magnitude limit for candles galaxies, so you can get a mass complete sample down to 10 to 8 for star forming galaxies at redshift 1. And even for the maximally old galaxies, you can also have a mass complete sample down to stellar mass 10 to 9 at redshift 1. So today I'm going to give you a flavor of how to use candles, such a deep sky survey, to uh, provide important clues on the formation of low mass galaxies. So the first part is the first star formation histories of low mass galaxies. So the star formation histories of low mass galaxies are expected to be bursty, as shown by different uh, uh, numerical simulations. Here is the movie from Fire, and in this movie it shows uh, gas content in the formation of low mass galaxies. You are probably uh, very familiar with this movie, so I just let it run through when I was talking. So, um, the first star formation, um, so in those low mass galaxies, uh, the intense star formation events would quickly exclude gases from those galaxies, resulting in a temporary quenching of star formation. But then you have new accreted gas, which will induce new star formation. So the star formation history of low mass galaxies are quite a per uh, uh, is quite a periodic and bursty. And this star formation burstiness is related to the origin of the scatter of star forming May sequence, which is a powerful diagnostic of uh, gas excretion history and feedback models. So many, uh, many um, papers have, have reported the, the evidence of local bursty low mass galaxies, for example, Li et al. or Bitsu et al. 2012. And the people expect that uh, when you go to higher redshifts, the star formation history of low mass galaxies are even more bursty or burstier because the, this cycle of temporary quenching and the new gas secretion would be much shorter at high redshift. But unfortunately, the, the observation at high redshift is rare because we need both deep UV imaging and uh, deep optical infrared spectroscopy. So I'm going to skip to the uh, next slide, not waiting for the movie. So here in this, in this work, we use a kind of uh, UV imaging in Goose North to measure the FUV luminosity. So the data includes both candles um, UV data and also the new HD UV survey PI by Pascal Aoshi. So um, this is the sky area covered by our data. And also we use the TKRS team catch redshift survey to provide the um, H, H beta uh, flux measurement. So TKRS is a CAC DEMOS survey. It's a magnitude limited survey covering the goods nose. So the, our whole sample includes about 160 galaxies, as shown here by the purple points. So those galaxies are very good representative of star-forming May sequence 
at a redshift 0.5 to 1. Next question is how do we measure the star formation burstiness? So we use the ratio of a star formation rate measured from H beta and the star formation rate measured from FUV. So if you have a population or a sample of bursty uh, star forming galaxies, when you observe them, you have many chances to see time when the emission line uh, luminosity is going down because of the temporary quenching where the FUV luminosity is still relatively high. That's because the nebular emission line is tracing star formation rate at the time scale of 10 million years, while FUV is tracing star formation rate at a much longer time scale, about 100 million years. So if you look at a, such a sample of bursty star forming galaxies, the average star formation rate, the average of the ratio of star formation, H beta star formation rate over FUV star formation rate would be less than one. But in, contra in contrast, if you have a sample of galaxies with a smooth star formation history, the ratio between F, uh, H beta and FUV would be close to one. So here's our main result, the ratio of H beta over FUV as a function of a stellar mass. So uh, all the black points are our galaxies, and the red uh, squares with arrow bars are the media and the one sigma level of each stellar mass beam. So you can immediately say two things from this plot. The first is that this ratio increases with stellar mass, or you can say it's decreased when stellar mass is going down. So at, uh, for galaxies with stellar mass 10 to 10, it's close to 1, meaning it's a const, uh, smooth star formation history, but when you go to lower stellar mass, 10 to 8.5 is about 1.6 uh, 1. times lower than 1. So this is consistent with having a bursty star formation history. The second thing is when you look at the same stellar mass, the ratio in our study is lower than the ratio from the local universe. Here we use the uh, work from Wieso et al. for zero, uh, zero galaxies at the stellar mass 10, uh, 10 to 9 or 10 to 8.5, our points are lower than we uh, uh, result. So that implies, the, uh, implies that the burstiness may have a uh, redshift evolution. So uh, to understand what's the physical meaning of this uh, lower than unity uh, star formation ratio, so we compared our result with the different models. Basically, we, can, we find that neither the non-universal initial IMF or nor the stochastic star formation and star or star cluster scale is able to fully explain our results. So we believe that this result is due to the bursty star formation history uh, of low mass galaxies. So at the beginning, I showed you the um, file simulation, you may wonder how our results compare with the results from the simulation. Um, here it is. This is the uh, H alpha to FUV ratio from file simulation, and the green curves with arrow bars shows their uh, media and one sigma level. So I overplot my results here with Siren. So the result so at the low mass regime matches very well. So um, in the file uh, galaxies, uh, it has uh, many uh, short bursts with time scale of uh, a few tens of million years. So this is a reassurance for us that the lower H alpha or H beta ratio observed in our galaxies is a result of a bursty star formation. So um, what does the uh, bursty star formation tell us? So um, we can actually convert the F, uh, H beta to FUV ratio to a burstiness, which tells you the stars form, the uh, ratio of the stars formed in the bursts over the number of the stars formed in the smooth phase. But uh, to do that, we use the model from uh, Vito et al. So basically, if the ratio is one, that means that you have equal amounts of stars formed in bursts and in the smooth phases. But if you ratio is greater than one, you have more stars formed in the burst phase, in the burst of, in the burst phase than in the smooth phase. So for galaxies with stellar mass 10 to 9, you have like four times of stars, more stars formed in the burst phase than in the smooth phase. So this is the takeaway point of my first part. 
And the second part, I'm going to change the geo a little bit to talk about environmental quenching, because I was put on the session of environmental quenching. <laughs> so people think that the environmental effects uh, are the primary process of uh, stopping star formation in low mass galaxies. And uh, Giha et al. found that when you, um, the quenching fraction of galaxies, low mass galaxies, drops quickly as a function of the distance to the massive host uh, galaxies. When you go beyond uh, 1.5 MPC, you have almost a no low mass uh, quenched galaxies. So the physical mechani mechanisms of environmental me quenching still uh, under investigation. So as we just heard from Sion, uh, the nice talk about stripping as a po uh, possible mechanism of quenching low mass galaxies. So the question we try to ask or we try to answer is, when was the environmental quenching connection be, um, uh, established for low mass galaxies? Can we see such uh, environment quen environmental quenching effect at the redshift 0.5, redshift 1, or even 2? So at which, uh, at the cosmic time that we first saw this quenching environmental connection to tell us the time scale of uh, environmental quenching. So, um, but the observation is challenged at redshift zero because again the distance low mass galaxies are faint. So, uh, we hope candles can uh, help us in uh, this study. So usually when you are trying to study environment quenching, you start from a massive host of galaxies and then you try to find a complete sample around of low mass galaxies around this massive host. Some of the low mass galaxies are quenched, they are red here where others are, not, are still forming stars, blue here, and then you can, you can uh, calculate the, quench, um, the quenching fraction and other statistics. But in our uh, work, we use another way. Instead, we start from uh, quenched uh, low-mass galaxies that try to find the uh, nearest uh, massive uh, neighbors ar uh, around the quenched galaxies. So, um, the advantage here is you don't need a complete low mass galaxy sample because we are trying to test whether or not quenching is, whether or not. So if you believe the quenching, environment quenching is the primary uh, process to stop star formation, so each quenched low mass galaxy should be uh, live close enough to a massive uh, galaxies, which is the kind of a tracer of the center of massive halo. So if the, the environmental quenching is true, then statistically you would, you would find the, uh, the distance to, uh, from a quenched low mass galaxies to massive galaxies uh, is, a short, uh, is uh, smaller than the distance from a normal star forming low mass galaxies to, the, uh, to its uh, massive neighbor. So the, uh, the sample contains candles galaxies with H-band magnitude brighter than 26 and from open redshift 0.5 to 2 and the stellar mass 8, 10.5. We divided the sample into different redshift and stellar mass beams. So in each uh, redshift and stellar mass beams, we use a UVG diagram rest frame to uh, separate the quenched galaxies and the star forming galaxies. This is the region where galaxies are quenched and this is the region where galaxies are forming stars. We leave some gap between these two regions to avoid the uh, overlap, uh, the contamination. So here are results um, for each galaxy with uh, uh, either star forming or quenched, we measure its uh, distance to the nearest uh, massive neighbor. The massive here means a stellar mass greater than 10 to 10.5. So this is a distribution showing a sample of uh, the distance called theta minimal, um, the distribution of theta minimal for a sample of quenched galaxies, red lines here, and a sample of star forming galaxies, blue lines here at this redshift beam. And the lower panels shows the cumulative di uh, dis uh, distribution function. So what you can see here is for these two beams, the KS test that tell us the distribution of quenched and um, uh, star forming galaxies are significantly different. So that means for galaxies in such being, being quenched or not has a relation with the environment, which is the distance 
to you to the nearest neighbor. However, in this uh, high redshift and high mass beam, the distribution of the two populations are almost identical, so that means being quenched or not in this massive beam has no relation with the environment. So um, here is a result for all the redshift and stellar mass beams. Do not try to read the numbers, just look at the colors. Here color red means the quenched, being quenched or not has a re relation with the environment, and the siren means has no relation with the environment. And the green beams means the galaxies are too faint to be observed. So the important thing here is around the redshift one, we always see this quenching environmental connection for galaxies between uh, uh, stellar mass 10 to 8 to 10 to 10, to 10, to 10. so that means the environment quenching already finished for those galaxies, and uh, that's why we see this connection. So um, what does this uh, result tell us? So here we put a simple uh, assumption that all galaxies start their environmental quenching from redshift 5. So then the, the quenching time scale is the, is the cosmic time from, from redshift 5 to the cosmic time we first hit a red box. For example, for galaxies at 9.5, the environmental quenching time scale would be 3.9, because that's a time from redshift 5 here to the first red box here. So if we do this uh, simple calculation and uh, probably over simplified assumption, we can get the quenching time scale. So here, all the black symbols or curves are from the literature, and the red symbols are from our study. So we have different uh, treatment for the cosmic uh, uh, variance and also the projection effects. So basically, uh, the result here is for, low mass, for the low mass regime, 10 to 8.5, and also for the very massive regime, 10 to 10, our results are uh, in good agreement with that in literature. So it's again based on our simple assumption that all galaxies start environmental quenching at redshift 5, but at stellar mass 10 to 9, so our results shows a significant deviation from that, from Sion's paper, and um, our time scale is about 4 gig year, where his time scale is about 8 gig year. So overall, we find a smooth uh, increase of the quenching time scale from uh, from stellar mass 10 to 8 to 10 to 10. So, uh, and we probably still need to think about more and discuss about more why this uh, um, uh, evasion happens. But one important thing is, in our method, we use the same database, same met methodology, and even same assumption to derive the quenching time scale. Whether in all, in all the literature, the quenching time scale are divided uh, derived from different uh, surveys or by using different methodology. So um, that's my summary of the part two. I will leave it here and uh, take questions. Thanks. A, a quick question for Ji Cheng before we go to coffee. No, everybody wants coffee. <laughs> <laughs>